On today's show, the Houston Rockets remain winless on the road and their in-season tournament hopes have been crushed as they lose to the Dallas Mavericks 121 to 115. The reason why they lost? A bunch of dumb, bad, unintelligent fouls. Not my words. Those are the words of head coach Ime Udoka. We're going to break down exactly what happened in this game coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Throw it up to Jalen Green. Shingun here in the short row. Oh my, that's the no look. Jabari for three on the win. Yeah! Look at Tari Eason. Here comes Tari. Oh! T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. The Houston Rockets select Amen Thompson and Cam Whitmore. One thing I have never done is not made the playoffs, and so we want to take that step here as well. Six. Five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. And the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for making LOR part of your day. Thank you for being an everydayer every single day. Got to break down this Rockets 121 115 loss. And this one stings because you know what? The Rockets should have won this game. They played well enough to win this game. And then they made a bunch of horrendous mistakes in the final like 14 minutes of this one. Like a terrible two minute stretch to close the third quarter that then snowballed into the fourth quarter and led to this fat L and bouncing them out of the in-season tournament. I don't even care about the in-season tournament. Who cares about the in-season tournament? I'm against it now. I hate it. All right. So what happened? What went wrong in this one? Let's early going in the game. Mavs jump out to the early lead, 29-22. Rockets actually respond pretty well in the second quarter. The, the Shout out to the bench unit guys, at least – their play in the first half because we will we will get to some of the issues in the second half. But uh, the play of the bench unit in the first half, uh, Aaron Holiday, Jay Shante, Tari Eason, Jeff Green, those guys kept the Rockets afloat and brought them back to within four at halftime. So the Rockets were down four at halftime, 54-50, and they had played pretty awfully. Like It was a pretty awful game from them in the first half of basketball, and they were still right there. And then they had a really strong third quarter. Jumped out, you know, it was it was good. The bench guys are checking in towards the end of the quarter. And, it, you know, Rockets make a couple plays and suddenly they go up by as many as, I think, like eight or nine. Like, they're, they're, they're looking really good. Mavs are on their heels. It, it was awesome. And then the stretch to end the third quarter. And then all the stuff that happened in the fourth quarter. The Rockets committed a bunch of Bad, dumb, unintelligent fouls. Ime Udoka's words, not mine. And he specifically highlighted not one, not two, but three specific plays. So without calling out any players by name, he highlighted these three specific plays. So the first of which he said, you know, he when calling out the bad fouls that they were committing, he said bottling up, you know, or, or fouling Kyrie Irving when we had him completely bottled up. That was Jay Sean Tate. It was the play where Kyrie Irving picked up his ball or picked up the ball, picked up his dribble, I should say, on the baseline, had nowhere to go with it. And Jay Sean Tate came over seemingly to double team for whatever reason and fouled Kyrie Irving, sent him to, sent him to the free throw line. There was another play where Ime Odoka highlighted picking up Kyrie Irving at half court and allowing him to get downhill and, you know, create an and one opportunity. That would be Tari Eason, who picked up Kyrie Irving and allowed Kyrie, one of the best one on one, you know, ball handler drivers, whatever, to get a full head of steam, get downhill and elevate and, and draw a foul and get an and one opportunity. And then the final one, and this was arguably the most egregious one that Ime highlighted multiple times, was fouling a three-point shooter, slapping him on the wrist 
well beyond the three-point line with only a couple seconds left on the clock or a second left on the clock, whatever it was, and that would be Dylan Brooks. So these were the three situations that Ime highlighted and pointed out repeatedly when talking about the Rockets' dumb, bad, unintelligent fouls in this game. And first off, in full agreement with him, these were all bad plays. And the concerning trend here is that Ime, and Ime highlighted this, is that there is a trend, is that this is a recurring issue, is that some of these guys are essentially repeat offenders of bad fouls. And that's got to be something that Ime has to iron out with these guys because these types of fouls cannot happen if you want to win games against good basketball teams. And what Ime said is basically happening is everybody's making a mistake. So like, okay, well, you'll have Dylan make a mistake. Then Jay Sean makes a mistake. Then Tari makes a mistake. And within, you know, you look down the line and once everybody makes, okay, one mistake here, one mistake, one mistake, one, then you're in the bonus. And when you're in the bonus against guys like Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic, they will take advantage of it. This Rockets team actually did a stellar job guarding Kyrie Irving through about 20, no, sorry, 34 minutes of basketball, through about 34 minutes of basketball. No, I take that back. Yeah, no, 34 minutes. That's the right math. Math is hard. Through 34 minutes of play, the Rockets held Kyrie Irving to three of 13 shooting and only seven points through the first 34 minutes of run. He hadn't attempted a single free throw. And then in the final two minutes of the third quarter, Kyrie went to the free throw line not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. He went to the free throw line five times at the end of the third quarter. And those free throws got him going. Kyrie Irving finished the game, again, with two minutes to go in the third quarter. He had seven points on three of 13 shooting. Kyrie Irving finished the game with 27 points on 8 of 22 shooting and was 9 of 9 at the free throw line. The Rockets managed to send Kyrie to the free throw line nine times in 14 minutes of game time. That is inexcusable. And a a big part, and I will say, look, I I get it. I want to highlight, I will throw in the caveat. This game was a complete ref show. That is not why the Rockets lost. The Rockets lost because they made a bunch of dumb mistakes, just like Ime highlighted. But... I did see somewhere it was apparently, I think it was 52 foul calls in a 48 minute basketball game. That's more than a foul blown, a foul whistle per minute in this game. Scott Foster, the crew chief, you know, no love lost between Rockets fans and Scott Foster. Uh, And it definitely, look, there was uh, the, the Dylan Brooks, his sixth foul in this game, the, the one where he fouled out, he, he, gently brushed Kyrie Irving on the shoulder on a drive. His hand made very incidental contact with Kyrie's shoulder, and Ime Odoka challenged that. And Scott Foster had the audacity to go look into the replay monitor and say to the entire world watching this game that the call on the floor was confirmed because of the gentle caress that Dylan Brooks had of Kyrie Irving's shoulder. That was such a ridiculous call um, and, and a very weak call to, to whistle for Dylan Brooks' sixth foul. But that's the kind of game that it was, is there were a lot of touch fouls that were being whistled. Luca, Kyrie, and not to mention that that sixth foul on Kyrie. I mean, it, Kyrie got the contact from Dylan on the shoulder and like a second later snaps his head back like he got popped in the face. Uh, just a complete embellishment. He, he should absolutely be receiving a flopping fine for that one. Uh, it would have been hilarious to see the the officiating crew have to rescind that one and, and walk that one back, especially because it was Dylan's sixth foul and the arena had already done the, you know, the the bye 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 song and all that. They didn't because, again, officials can never own up to their mistakes. But that's not why that call is not why the Rockets lost. And, he, and look, it was going both ways. Like there were some really egregious calls going against both teams, like some really, t- you know, bad foul calls, touch calls, whatever. There were plenty of times that like Al P got to the free throw line. I was like, I don't think there was any contact on some of the, you know, there was now there were plenty of times that there was contact was missed. It was just the officiating crew sucked in this game going both ways, but the Rockets committed a bunch of, like he said, dumb, bad, unintelligent fouls. And that is why they lost this game. 
Now, coming up, I do want to answer one more important question about this game and why the Rockets did a couple things uh, down the closing stretch of this one, as well as getting into our Locked on Rockets player of the game from this one, Alperin Shingun, with a 30-piece against Derek Lively. Jabari Smith Jr., his usage rate, uh, as well as his just really fantastic month of November, uh, and hopefully a bigger role for him down the line, as well as we got to talk about Shalen Green and this ridiculous home versus road split that he's got going on because he looks like a superstar when he plays in Toyota Center and then he just looks like he doesn't maybe even belong on an NBA roster when he's on the road. It's been really rough. We're going to get to all of that and so much more here in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Our partners at eBay Motors have teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each and every week all season long. Whether you're prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's see who Josh has picked out for us this week on eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. First up, we got Jaden Ivey. His level of play has improved since joining the starting lineup, and with the Pistons going nowhere, surely they're going to continue to invest in him unless, well, uh, the whole Killian Hayes starting the season thing was a little weird, but now that Jaden Ivey is back in the starting lineup, he's probably not going anywhere, so it seems like a really safe pick to go with Jaden Ivey. Josh also has picked out for us Gordon Hayward. Um, If Hayward was dropped, he should be grabbed now that LaMelo Ball is out with an ankle injury, so now that... There's no LaMelo in the lineup for the Hornets for the foreseeable future. Obviously, Gordon Hayward's usage should skyrocket. He's definitely a pickup that you're going to want to keep an eye out for. And then lastly, Sadiq Bey. Bey is elevated to the starting lineup with Jalen Johnson out and should be able to be serviceable for fantasy teams. So another name you want to be keeping an eye out for for your fantasy roster. Now, Josh Lloyd from Locked On Fantasy Basketball is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows the championship team is about each player being a perfect fit, the exact same as with your vehicle with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. They've got brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your car needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, one point that I wanted to bring up as I, you know, kind of illustrating the the reason the Rockets lost this game, which was all the fouls committed there at the end of the third quarter and going into and in, including the fourth and final frame. Again, they, they defended Kyrie Irving well enough to win this game through about 34 minutes of play. And they, hell, honestly, you know, Luca, he had 41 points, but he took 29 shots to get there. It was the free, it was just giving up all the free throws at the end, completely killed them. They held Grant Williams to zero points on 0 of 5 shooting. They held Derek Lively to just eight points. They held Josh Green to five points uh, off the bench. Tim Hardaway Jr. was only four of 12 for 11 points. Now, Derek Jones Jr. did hurt them a little bit off the bench. And then Dante Exum, former Rocket, a revenge game, if you will, for Dante Exum, uh, had 12 points on three of four. But I really felt like the Rockets did play well enough to win this game, especially with how they turned up the intensity there in the second quarter and and there in the third quarter before those mistakes started to kind of pile up the fouls, all of that. And again, you you cannot give a guy like Kyrie Irving a chance to get himself going right, to see the ball go through the hoop and then to just, you know, turn him. He, they, he uh, he he unlocked his game. Basically after being a non-factor the entire night, the free throws really unlocked his game. And again, you could tell Ime was so visibly frustrated post game with those three guys specifically. So Dylan Brooks, Jay Sean Tate, and Tari Eason. That's why Aaron Holiday closed the game. I know a lot of Rockets fans were confused at Ime's choice to go with Aaron Holiday when Dylan Brooks fouled out of this game. Aaron Holiday was the one guy that wasn't committing stupid fouls in this one. So he was the one that got the nod to close this one out. That's it makes sense. He Dylan fouled out. He wasn't going to go to Jay Sean Tate. He wasn't going to go to Tari Eason, two guys who was clearly frustrated with some of the mistakes that they had made earlier in the game. So that's why he went with Aaron Holiday. I, I'm, I'm 
99.5% sure that that was the, the reasoning behind that pick to close this one out. Uh, and it makes sense. Aaron Holiday had himself a, a solid game in his own right, uh, was defending at a high level, helped the Rockets stay in it in the first half. Now, that we're not going to talk about that floater at the end of the game that I don't even think drew iron. Uh, it was a pretty pretty rough shot from Aaron Holiday, but he had an overall solid game, uh, and I, I could understand the reasoning for wanting him out there uh, with the closing lineup, especially with, again, the mistakes that some of the other guys had made. But, Got to talk about your Locked on Rockets player of the game from this one, and that's Alper and Shingun, who did not have one of his better nights starting the game. At one point, if memory serves, he was like two of seven shooting from the floor, and I do think that maybe a little bit early on, Derek Lively's length was bothering him, just a skosh, and then, but then Alp figured it out. Like, Alp understood. It's one of those things where Alp's such a high IQ guy, over the course of the game, he's going to figure out exactly what spots he can get to against a certain player. He's going to understand how a defense is shading him. Uh, and, and credit to the Mavericks defense early on in this game. It, they did a really great job. I even leaned over and I asked my uh, my locked on Mavs guy, since I was in Dallas for the game, I leaned over and was like, hey, what, what are the Mavs rated defensively this season? It was like a 25th. And I was like, they don't look like the 25th best defense in the NBA tonight. They look like they're a top 10 defense guarding this Rockets team. They were running the Rockets off the three point line. They were doubling effectively. Like Shingun would get the ball in the post and they'd send like a quick flash double team at him and force the ball out of his hands early in the game. So, but then as the game wore on, Shingun kind of figured things out. So he finished the game with a 30 piece, 31 points on 10 of 19 shooting it was over two at the three point line, uh, 11 of 14 at the stripe, and then had nine rebounds, six assists, and a block. Uh, also three turnovers. I will say, I felt like, and this was this isn't a thing exclusive to Alpi. This kind of extends to the whole team. There were a handful of offensive rebounds that were like back-breaking offensive rebounds because when you work your ass off to get a stop against a Luka Doncic or a Kyrie Irving on a given possession, two of the premier offensive talents, two of the premier ISO guys in the NBA, you put in all that work to stop them or to force them into a bad shot, and then you can't close out the defensive possession with a rebound, it just feels awful. Like the number of times that the, the Mavs got a big key offensive rebound and then were able to turn a miss into a bucket to gain some momentum or cover some ground or create some separation. It happened too many times. You know, and a big part of that is Derek Lively and Derek Jones Jr., their length, their athleticism, just getting over the top of guys, getting a fingertip or two on a basketball and tipping it out towards a teammate. You've got to gang rebound. You've got to rebound by committee. Sometimes that means throwing two guys, throwing two bodies on a guy, right? If you've got Derek, and, and a big part of that was how the Rockets were uh, their, their defensive game plan, which involved Alper and Shingun, they actually didn't have Alpi guarding Derek Lively to start the game. They had him on Grant Williams. They basically parked him out on the perimeter guarding a shooter because they didn't want Alpi involved in the pick and roll actions. They didn't want Luka Doncic to carve up Alpi in the pick and roll. So, and then later in the middle of the game, they did let Alpi guard Derek Lively or guard the five. And, and then later in the game, they switched it again. So, there were a lot of moments where Alpi was actually out on the perimeter and wasn't necessarily in position to rebound uh, or to put a body on Derek Lively in the paint. And when that happens, you know, if you've got two smaller guys, you know, uh, Fred Van Vliet and Jalen Green can both throw throw their body on Derek Lively and keep him away from a rebound. So it, the onus has to be on the rest of the team at times to, again, gang rebound to close out a defensive possession strong. But I will say that Alpi figured it out and and had a, he had a massive second half, uh, you know, on his way to that thirty piece, he had Derek Lively lost, looking all out of sorts, and and you would think again, long, big, athletic guys would be like Alpi's kryptonite, but Alpi's basically figured out like how to play around these guys is the funny thing because I think the mistake would be if you're a smaller guy and you've got a guy with more length than you, you're not going to play over the top of the guy that's taller, longer, more athletic, so. Alpi's like answer has been to go up and under a lot of these guys that are bigger than him, right? So we saw it happen a lot in this game where he would get to, you know, get you know, get the defender on his back, get lively on his back, and either make some really quick moves from like the elbow where he would just like um, you know catch the ball and immediately turn and go and catch lively by surprise, or give him like the quick fake, like he's going baseline and go back towards the middle, or vice versa. 
But my personal favorite is one that he's it's it's kind of like his patented move, right? When he when he does the spin, the pirouette, but he he goes up like he's gonna do the hook with the right, then he spins back to the opposite shoulder and looks like he's gonna go up with the left, and then he does another spin and he gets back to the right, and when he goes back to the right the second time, he kind of like dips his shoulder into the defender, and they're so off balance from going like right, left, right, left, that he's able to create enough separation to get that little baby hook shot off. And he hit that a couple times against Lively, and it, it just feels like that's kind of his patented go-to move, which shout out to this officiating crew who decided to call a travel on LP at one point in this game where he literally didn't drag the pivot foot. It was just down. He does that move at least twice a game, two or three times a game, every game. And it hasn't been whistled to travel until this one for God knows what reason. Uh, so, yeah, just Alpi had a very strong night against a very high quality defender in Derek Lively. I know Lively's just a rookie, but he looks really good. He's easily like it was talking about it with some Mavs guys of the game. He's he's probably the third most impactful player on this Mavericks team. And to do to be that as a rookie, there's a reason I really wanted him on the Rockets this past draft. Uh, he's going to do big things for this Mavericks team. And, and Luca is going to get that man paid at some point down the line. Coming up, want to get into, want to talk about Jabari Smith Jr. And his usage, his increased efficiency here in the month of November. And hopefully what that means is a bigger offensive role for him a little bit further down the line. And then also Jalen Green and his uh, incredibly frustrating home versus road splits. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel because right now new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins and all you have to do is wager $5. It's that simple. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. Right now, you can take a look at the outright betting favorites for Super Bowl 58 in a dead heat for the first place spot. You got the Kansas City Chiefs and San Francisco 49ers both at plus 430. A little ways behind them, the Philadelphia Eagles at plus 460. And then some separation between the top three and the rest of the pack. You got plus 700, the Baltimore Ravens, the Dolphins at plus 900, and the Cowboys at plus 1,000. They've also got spreads, player props, over-unders, so many different betting uh, betting lines that you can check out. You got to go check them out. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started this NFL season. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, I do want to know, let me know in the YouTube comments, are you are you encouraged by this game? Yes or no? Like, are you are you at the point where you're past moral victories? Because I, I don't think this team is has graduated beyond moral victories, but at the same time, I remain encouraged by this game because the mistakes are things that can be cleaned up and I, I trust Ime and the coaching staff to address and fix those mistakes in time. And I also, I want to highlight here that the vibe around this team is just so incredibly different from last year. You know, I, I look, I, I, I'm around the team a lot and I have been for a few years now and last year and in pre, you know, during the Silas era, you, you'd have a loss even a close game loss, right? Like one where the Rockets actually looked like they could have won the game. And you go back to the locker room and guys would be goofing off, laughing, you know, whatever. They'd be, they'd be fine with it. Now it's like, you know, everybody's just pissed because they know that they should have won this game. Like Fred was pissed after this one. Ime was frustrated. Dylan was mad, and Dylan took ownership of of the foul call, by the way. At post-game, I got the chance to, to ask him about the specific moment because Ime had highlighted it and, and Dylan said that that was some year three she like that, that he that he wholeheartedly took it you know in stride that he understands that he, he said it was a bad foul uh that he that he messed that up and you know he, he 100% took ownership of that mistake this team is just different you know, and that's what gives me the confidence that this isn't a loss that they're going to look at and be like, ah, okay, we'll get them next time. This is a loss where they're going to look at and say, okay, we should have won this game. Here are the reasons why we should have won this game. And this is what we need to clean up for the next time we play this team or just for the next game that we play because this team has 
aspirations of being a good basketball team. In fact, they are a good basketball team. To, to play the Mavericks, who are playing you know some solid basketball this season, to have the game as close as it was, despite some of the despite many of the mistakes that the Rock has made, unforced errors that they made, to be in that game the way that they were is encouraging. So I, I remain encouraged after this game. I'm curious what your thoughts are. So let me know in the YouTube comments. Now for Jabari Smith Jr., a really strong evening for him. 16 points on 7 of 11 shooting, 2 of 5 from the three-point line, had 9 rebounds, 2 assists, and a block. And we're starting to see a steady diet of Jabari Smith Jr. in the mid-range, in the mid-post, at the nail. And I'm loving every second of it. Because when Jabari gets the ball and can either face up or put his back to a small to a smaller player and then get to that turnaround fadeaway, it feels unguardable and it feels like the shot's going in every single time. Like I've grown to the point where when I see Jabari elevate for a midi, not like where he like not like a dribble pull up midi, but like where he gets it either in triple threat at the, you know, at the elbow or where he gets his back against the defender and can put, can then turn into a face up jump or whatever. It's like those that's his sweet spot. And seeing the Rockets identify and go to that more and more and more over these recent few games has been an incredibly welcome sight because they need more offensive weapons. They need more reliable production offensively. And when you look at the month that Jabari's having here in November, he shot 66.4 TS, 66.4 true shooting percentage in the month of November. And for the season, he's up to just under 61% true shooting. He is the best, highest true shooting percentage of all the Rocket starters, but he also has the lowest usage rating. Because again, at times, he's been the fourth or sometimes even the fifth option behind even Dylan Brooks in the Rockets starting lineup. And I do think that it's been a slow going process, but I think that Ime is starting to see, hey, Jabari can at least be a play finisher for me. Now, Jabari may not have the skill set right now to start a play from the very beginning and have the ball at the top of the key and like dribble in and create create his own. That's fine. But Jabari can be an elite play finisher. And we're seeing that a little bit more and more and more, and we're seeing him get more comfortable with it. So I'm really op- I- I'm really curious to see where this goes because if Jabari can start being more of a focal point within this Rockets offense, I- again, I've been banging this drum for a minute. I would love to see Jabari with some of those second, you know, some of those bench units, right? Get him out there with Jalen Green. Get him out there and maybe stagger the minutes, maybe you know, sub him out a little bit earlier, pull bring Tari in a little bit sooner, and give Jabari some run with the second unit where he can get that five out spacing. Cause the second unit's basically playing five out ISO ball anyways. It's basically five out. Jeff Green sets a pick for Jalen Green, or Jalen tries to ISO on somebody with a mismatch or whatever. And it just doesn't really look great right now. But if you get Jabari out there with that group and let him get at the nail, let him get at the elbow and face up and, and kind of get to his game that way with five, you know, four shooters around him, I think you could be cooking with something a little bit. So really encouraged by Jabari's play in this one. And he also some, continues the strong defense, you know, for, for all the mistakes and the issues that the wings were having in this game. I will say Jabari had a couple fouls here and there too. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, completely, disregard, you know, some of the touch fouls that he committed, some of the fouls against Luca that he had. But by and large, I thought Jabari did a really good job in this game. He was tasked with, you know, at times guarding the pick and roll actions with Derek Lively. Then at times he was guarding Luca on switches. And it just showcases, again, his versatility on the defensive side of the basketball. So really liked what we saw out of Jabari in this game. That's, I'm just like the, the, the sigh because I'm just... We have to talk about Jalen splits. We have we have to talk about Jalen splits because it's getting ridiculous, man. Like Jalen looks like a superstar when he plays at Toyota Center, and then he doesn't. He looks like he should be getting sent down to the G League when he's playing on the road. The the splits are insane for Jalen Green. His his home versus road splits are kind of ridiculous. So so far this season. He's played nine games at home and six games on the road. Here are his numbers from these games. So at home, he's averaging 22 points, five rebounds, and three assists on 45% shooting from the floor, 37% from three, and 78% 
from the free throw line. So 58% true shooting when he's playing at Toyota Center. <clears throat> Pardon me. On the road this season, six games on the road, he's averaging just under 15 points a game. So uh, a little more than seven points per game less. Only just under four rebounds a game. And oh, his assists are actually slightly up. So 3.2 assists per game on the road. Net marginal. Um, his shooting percentage numbers. 36.5% from the floor. 27% from three. And then his free throw shooting is slightly elevated. 82% on the road. For a whopping 47% true shooting for Jalen Green on the road. Now, maybe this is a case of small sample size. It's a six-game sample size on the road. But this also goes back to his first couple of years in the league. And there's something, I don't know what it is, but Jalen performs so much better at home. And there's first off, there are a lot of young players like this. It's not, it's not just a Jalen Green thing. There are a lot of young players that play just fine at home because they're they're at home, they're sleeping in their own bed, they've got their routine, they're around their family, friends, whatever. You're practicing at home, it's your it's it's your facility, like all of it. Whereas on the road, you're in a different hotel every night, you're you you know, you're not sleeping in your own bed, you're not on your same routine, like it, it's it's different. And you, as an NBA player, you have to learn how to, Eric, Eric Gordon talked about this last year, you have to learn how to have a routine on the road so that you can stay consistent with your game, with your approach, with your day-to-day, -day, all of it. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just there needs to be better consistency for Jalen, but I mean, these splits are, are insane because if you could get Jalen, if you could just average his splits together, like just bring down his level of play at home, but elevate his level of play on the road. I, the Rockets are going to have, would be, uh, you know, a top four, a top four team in the Western conference right now, if that were the case. But some of these road games have been so bad from Jalen in this game against the Mavericks, Jalen 12 points on five of 14 shooting, just two of six from three point land. He had three rebounds. He had five assists, but, Four of those five came in the first quarter, and then he only had one assist the rest of the way. And then two turnovers. Now, I will I will say, I liked, I liked some of the defensive aggression we saw from Jalen late in the game. Um, he was bodying up. He was essentially playing the small forward slot with Fred Van Vliet and Aaron Holiday both out there at the end of the game. And at one point, he even... Luka Doncic had him on a switch and Luka tried to, you know, body Jalen Green and, and, you know, got to, you know, kind of the, the baseline area and tried to go up, you know, tried to shoulder him and then go up for a jumper. And Jalen actually blocked the shot, surprisingly. Maybe not surprising that Jalen blocked it, but just surprising in the sense that Jalen actually deed up and put the clamps on Luka. Uh, but then the Mavs recovered the ball and, and still scored it anyways. I think, in fact, I think Lucas scored it on that very possession after somebody else recovered the basketball. One of those offensive rebounds I was talking about earlier. Um, but then on the other end, like just, you know, Luca was guarding Jalen on, on certain possessions and Jalen wasn't able to torch Luca. Like Luca is a turnstile defensively. Jalen should be cooking him every possession down. Like there's just, I don't know what it is, but there, there's something that that is the the mental whatever it is is that that killer attitude is is maybe it's missing on the road or something. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but the consistency continues to be an issue for Jalen Green. Um, and until they figure out a way to get him more consistent, you know, you look up and down this roster. Alpi had a strong game. Dylan Brooks had some of the fouls, had some of the issues, but he had 16 points on seven of 13 shooting. Like you, the, it was good production and good defense from, from Dylan Brooks, despite that, you know, pretty egregious foul mistake at the end. And some of the fouls along the way, Jabari had a good game. Uh, Fred, maybe you're missing a little bit of his offense production, just three of nine shooting one of seven from three point land, but he had 12 assists and no turnovers. So it's like, it's hard to look at Fred and say, hey, he had a bad game when you have 12 dimes and no turnovers. Like, he's doing his job as the point guard, getting guys involved, and he's he's taking shots within the flow of the offense. The Rockets shouldn't need Fred to, to give them 20-plus points and 10-plus dimes. Like, that's just an unfair level of expectations for that, for that guy to do consistently. Uh, Fred's game should have been good enough for them to be able to win this one. The weak link right now in the starting lineup is Jalen Green. That is... 
That's just the fact. And until that improves, until he levels out his consistency, there's going to be games like this. There's going to be a lot of losses like this, especially when the the there's such a stark difference in his play at home at Toyota Center versus on the road. And unfortunately for this Rockets team, they're right back at it the very next day with a not so easy opponent in the Denver Nuggets. They got to deal with them. They got to deal with Jokic again. They've played the Nuggets a ton of a ton already in the early going of the season. And they're going to get them again. They're going to play the Nuggets all of their meetings with the Nuggets before uh, before Christmas is kind of absurd because the schedule has been released for that gap week where we didn't know what games the Rockets were going to get with the in season tournament and and all that. So. They'll play a home game against the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder on Wednesday, and then they'll play another game on the road against, I believe, the Denver Nuggets on Friday. So all the Nuggets matchups just pff, out of the way super early, which I guess is you know beneficial for the Rockets since the Nuggets don't have Jamal Murray. But we'll see how Jalen performs on the road in Denver. Maybe it's the you know maybe the altitude helps him. I, I don't know. Uh, But he's got to get it figured out and got to level out the consistency because the Rockets are a consistent Jalen Green away from being like a top four seed in the in the Western Conference right now this season. That's he's the swing factor for this team. Everybody else in the starting lineup has been by and large pretty consistent in their production, in their play. And Jalen's been the one guy who's had games where he's gone, you know, he's had very high highs and then very low lows. And that just, it really just can't happen. I think we're beyond it at this point. We're almost a quarter of the way through this season and something's got to change for him or or the Rockets have to figure something else out. So that's going to be it for today's episode. I do want your thoughts on this loss from the Houston Rockets. Give me your thoughts in the YouTube comments about anything I shared, highlighted throughout the, the course of the episode. I hope I didn't miss anything. At one point I was, I it's first off, it's, now five in the morning because I did the drive to and from Dallas in one day because I'm an idiot. And then two, I started recording this show and I got about 80% of the way through it and something happened and the recording had an error on my first pass through the recording. So this is actually my second attempt at doing this show at five in the morning, which is annoying because during the first attempt, I had a really funny 420 joke in there because I looked at the clock and it was 420. So with that, That's going to do it for today's episode. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.